Good morning, everyone. Hey, Mike. Welcome to Satsang. Nice to meet. Oh, let me read the schedule. We have Shabd by our dear sister Sumit, and it's the Guru has kept his hand on our heads, yet our minds keep distracting us. 
Um, then there is a talk by me. Then there is a, a 10 minute uh, a talk from Tina, from our dear sister, Tina Dillon. And it's about Guru Nanak Dev Ji. So, and then we'll uh, listen to our Holy Father Ishwar Puri Ji and uh, we'll meditate in love and devotion. So um, enjoy satsang. Oh, and here's the beautiful schedule. It looks like there's icicles behind master. Very beautiful. I hope you liked it. So we can start with our dear sister's meet. Dear brothers and sisters, good morning, good evening, namaste, Radha Swami. So this Shabad is from Swamiji Maharaj. So I will translate this Shabad in English. Guru has kept his hand on our head yet our minds keep distracting us. But we are in the protection of our master 24 by 7. Still, we have no patience and stay with the mind. Guru forever keeps us under his shelter and is doing all our works. He loves us so much that all our problems and enemies have been gone far away. He is most merciful going under his shelter. Our karmas are washed away. His mercy is so great that we can put we cannot put it in the words. When soul goes inside and takes in the holy nectar, then soul reaches the stage of ecstasy. Hearing the inner sound current, the soul, soul starts rising in the inner realms. Guru resolves all our problems and even Kal is afraid of him. Guru finishes our desires, attachments, our egos and all illness to the word all illness of this word with his grace. Guru, who is the form of Radha Swami, is giving us all his grace and love. The beings are blessed. We are blessed and lucky who has, the people who are blessed and lucky who have undergone his shelter. Those who have real love and devotion towards the master and their soul merges into the master. My sleeping fortune has finally rose. Even the word is astonished seeing this grace on me guru has given so much love and grace to me my enemies are even jealous of my happiness guru is my mother and father both who can praise such a true guru my guru is so gracious that i cannot praise him i keep chanting his name throughout my day and night so now i will sing the shabad Guru Dhara Sis Par Haat Man Kyun Soch Kar Guru Dhara Sis Par Haat Man Kyun Are you? Yes. 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 You will? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, we're all looking forward. Next shop from you is going to be from in English. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <try. laughs> yes. Okay. Cool. All right. Okay, my dear holy family, um, welcome again to Satsang, the words of truth, where we sit in the warmth of our holy father, God, mother, God, and we all sit in the circle of lovers to get that warmth, to get that drink, to get a dip into divinity, a dip into eternity. Really, we cast our nets into the infinite eternity, hoping to get something beautiful, to fill up our nets with love. And that love keeps us going. That love keeps us going. It's in love that we grow together. We are all growing together every day in love, in love, day after day after day we fall more and more and more deeper and deeper and deeper in love with our higher self, with God, with Ishwarji inside of us. Yesterday, I had to work like 13 and a half hours or even more, maybe 14 hours because it's going to snow today. I put like two days in one. And, uh, and then I found out that 
since 13 hours talk is only 10 minutes so it's like master um is putting me to seva and i am uh, very tired i i didn't like sleep little just a little bit because i came home like at 3 34 and then i remembered the story of my master santakar singh who used to say you know he was so old but he was always traveling ishwarji the same way he was uh, he was 94 and he could work all the time non-stop and my master said that even if the cart has no wheels <laughs> but if the horse is strong then the cart will keep going forward the most important thing is that uh, the horse is strong and i'm and today i pray to master that okay my soul uh, i depend on my soul on you on my inner master to bring the satsang and to um and to keep this cart with no wheels <laughs> because <laughs> it's tired keep it going that story was from my master santakar singh and of course i start satsang by bowing down my head to all the gurus to my holy father santakar singh to my holy father ishwar puri ji and baba sawan singh that's how we start the satsang where two or more gather in my name there i am and we start uh, we start with them we continue with them and we finish with them. As the master, he's everything. He's the beginning, he's the middle, he's the end of our journey. Our whole journey is about master, nothing else. It's about master that is the embodiment of love and we concentrate on that love. We concentrate on that love day and night. And when we are concentrating on that love, then what happens then we are under God's will. There is a story from the Dalai Lama that I heard a couple of days ago. And you know how the Chinese, they occupied Tibet and they, uh, they, they destroyed most of the monasteries, so many monasteries they destroyed. And they, they put many monks into like, somehow some type of a concentration camp to, uh, to re-educate them. Um, and then one of the monks, he was sent there. He was sent there and uh, he went through that camp for a few years and then they released him. When he came back, the Dalai Lama wanted to meet with him. So the Dalai Lama asked him, uh, how was it? What happened? How was it? And he said, I was only threatened twice. I was only threatened twice. And the Dalai Lama thought, oh, what did they do to you? What did they do to you? Did they try to kill you twice? Or he said, no. I was threatened twice to lose my compassion towards the Chinese. Isn't that so beautiful? I was threatened twice to lose my compassion towards the Chinese. It means, it means that really the Buddhist monks understood the law of karma totally, understood the law of karma totally. And that monk, that monk who was in prison in that camp, relearning camp where they torture people, where they beat people, where they put people to the task to re-educate them and to brainwash them. He kept his composure. He kept his composure and he kept loving his enemy. He kept loving his enemy. He kept loving his enemy and he was threatened twice. I bet they tortured him to hell or something that he could lose his compassion, that he could lose his compassion. So who can do that? Who can do that other than a soul that is very strong in its inner self, very strong in God, very strong in love, really? When Jesus said, love thy enemy as thyself, he meant it. Love thy enemy as thyself. He really meant it. And how can we love our enemy as ourselves? Sometimes it, it's a big wonder if we can love our enemy as ourself and if somebody slaps us on the right cheek to really turn our left cheek to really it takes a lot a lot and a lot of spiritual development a lot of dwelling in love and becoming love to reach those stages where we totally forgive our enemy and turn our cheek to the other way turn our cheek to the other way and this monk this monk really was put to the hard test this monk was put to the hard test and 
This is sometimes what the masters do to us, to show us our spiritual development. In order to show us our de spiritual developments, they create situations. They create situations. And from this situation, the way we react, the way we react really corresponds to our spiritual development. The way we react corresponds to our spiritual development. This is like the measure gauge to see where we are on the path of love, where we are on the path of love. Master will bring up situations. Sometimes will bring up situations from within the circle of lovers, where one lover uh, says something, the other lover doesn't like, and then it is the way we react. Especially in the ashrams, I remember, in the ashrams of Santakar Singh, where I used to go there, everybody was a patient. Everybody was a patient there. As an ashram is like a big hospital to the souls where people look at themselves daily, they do the diary daily, they introspect themselves daily, and then they go through the test, the daily test of really interacting with other lovers of God. And then during that interaction, we could test ourselves. We could test ourselves to see our spiritual level. And yes, in the ashrams, the big hospital there, there's always the management, somebody telling you what to do, and, 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 and the mind doesn't want to do what somebody else wants you to do. And then it creates a circumstances. And the way people react, the way people react really shows their spiritual level. Uh, in Hafiz, in the poetry of Hafiz, he says that, that very few people, very few people withstand the fire of purification because really we have to go through the scrubbing and the fires of purification. Many, once the purification starts, they pack their bags and leave hurriedly, like absconders. They just carry their bags and run away. They cannot stand the cleaning. And what does Rumi say about people who stand the cleaning and free themselves from all attachments, from all desires, from everything that is opposite of God? Rumi says, the sky bows down to somebody who has freed himself from all desires, has freed himself from all desires, all attachments, and all the pleasures of this world. The sky bows down to such a person. Wow, How, what a beautiful thing, what a beautiful thing to attain. In another poem of Rumi, he says this world is like a child's play. This world is a child's play. And those adults are the only ones that have freed themselves from all desires, are the only adults in this world. The rest who are still interested, and he calls in the poem, he says, the rest who are still interested in war and sex. <laughs> the people who are still interested in war in sex and the pleasures of this world, Rumi says that they are just still children, still children playing the child's play in this world. And to become adults, to become adults, really, they have to free themselves. They have to free themselves from the shackles that have been put on them, those sweet pleasures that have poison behind them, sweet pleasures that have poison behind them, that really enslave us and entrap us, that really enslave us and entrap us, that the poison, that the opposite power, you know, we are in love with everything. When, when we are awakened as soul and we start to see it, that it's an old show, we call it maybe the negative power, but it's really, it's just really part of the creation of Lord God. He created light and he created darkness. In the duality world of time and space, there has to be, for the light, there has to be darkness. It's like a balance. It's like a balance and with two scales. So if there is light here, there has to be darkness of equal weight. And that's why this world is full of everything, full of light, full of darkness, full of everything. So we don't hate it. 
We just see the reality of it, really. The lovers of God, they see the reality. They see the reality, and then they fall in love with everything. They fall in love with everything. That means even if a devil comes to them, even and when when we when we awake more and more and more into our real self, into God and into love, our inner eye becomes so keen. It sees through the body. It sees through the body. Really, it sees through the body, which is the container. As they say, the eyes, the eyes are doorway to the soul. And the eyes of the spiritual lovers of God is keen. And it can go through through any eyes and see what's inside that baggage that baggage <laughs> that baggage could be so beautiful from the outside so beautiful from the outside however once you look inside you will be surprised you will be surprised what's in there you will be as the, the mamluks of the world the mamluks the ones who are not connected with the holy light and the holy song if you are not connected with the holy light and the holy song, well, then what are you connected to? Then you're connected with the opposite still. You're connected with darkness. You're connected with darkness and the five enemies of the soul, the anger, lust, ego, greed, and attachment are fully dwelling there, fully dwelling there. And then if you have eyes that can see, ears that can hear, if you have the wisdom of God, if you have that penetrating look, then you can see what's behind the veil. You can see what's behind the veil, what's into that package, what is in that package. And then this is how, this is how really the spiritual people, after God blesses them with an eye that can see and an ear that can hear, an eye that can penetrate a veil, and then an, an, an ear that can hear beyond walls, then what happens? Then they start to see the reality much more clear, much more, much more, and much more clear that if something comes to us in a form of a beautiful gift, wrapped, wrapped as a most beautiful gift and is handed to us, but then once we look at it, then we see what's inside, we see what's inside, then we might just run away if we see the truth, what's inside that package. So a lot of a lot of us, a lot of us had a lot of desires, a lot of attachments to the worldly things, to the worldly things. And when we had them, and we are also on the path of love, on the path of love. We have that wish to become one with the absolute truth, one with God, one with love. Then our inner master, with the eye of truth, opens our eye and lets us see what are we attached to, what are what kind of desires we have to maybe that a person, and that person. When we see that person, then we look inside, and then we look inside. And then we might get scared. We might get scared. And master will show us. Master will show us as we develop more and more and more spiritually. And we start to see beyond the veil. We start to go inside the baggage and see by the grace of master. Then we really don't want to touch anything from this world. We really learn the lesson not to touch anything from this world. I wish I could tell you, I wish I could tell you my heart more and more and more of my experiences with what I'm saying, my experiences of like just noticing, just having the, 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 the gut feeling and the inner feeling of the, the people who come in our life. They come, sometimes an enemy comes in a garb of a friend, an enemy comes in a garb of a friend, an enemy comes in a garb of a very, very sweet friend. And when the enemy comes in the garb of a friend, then we let loose that, oh, he's our friend. He's our friend. But once, and we relax, we relax our guards. Once we relax our guards, if he is truly an enemy, then he will really stab us. Then we will really suffer and die because we thought that he was a friend or she was a friend. And then 
the truth came out, the truth came out, that really this is the reality of this world, that anything that takes our attention away from love is not really our friend, is not really our friend. And I'm so sorry to say, but sometimes our worst enemies, our worst enemies come to us in this world as family members, as people who say that they, are lo they love us, they love us so much, they love us so much. But when we look deeply inside, we see that they are taking us the other way, that they don't want us to go inside, that anytime we say we want to go inside, we want to find God inside of us directly, the other power, the other power, the power of darkness starts to work through them and they will start to hold you. They will start to hold you, telling you, no, you don't do it. And they will put anything to keep you outside, anything to keep you outside. I remember when I used to travel to go see my family and, and don't take me wrong. I love my family. I love my family, but I know the truth. I love my family, but I know the truth. And in the beginning, in the beginning, when soul is not strong enough, that means when soul is still controlled by the mind and it's not, it's not really a strong soul because it's, the mind has control over it still. And then, but that soul is, let's say, is trying to find God. Once it goes in the company of such people and spends a lot of time with such people, then their darkness starts to seep in. And then what happens? Really, downward spiritual flow. That means we go downward spiritually. I have, I have really, I have really tested it in my life when I went, uh, uh, when I went either with family or friends, and I spent a lot of time there, how their energies start to seep in me, how it started to affect me, how it started to affect me, and how it really deharmonized my spiritual self. But, but when we grow more and more in God, when we grow more and more in God, when we become strong in love, then their power becomes weak and our power becomes stronger. That means when our soul is in control, no matter where we are, no matter where we are, we cannot be affected by people's energies, but we can affect we cannot be affected, but we can affect. That means we become like a powerhouse, like a power cleaning house, a powerhouse, a torch, a torch in the midst of darkness. And the torch in the midst of darkness brings the light. It brings the light and changes darkness into light. In the same way, even if our families, we know the truth about them, that they are really not really our families, they are really our, what are families really? To tell us, to tell you the truth, really, what are families? People who are our brothers, our mothers, and our sisters, they are, they are our debitors and creditors. That means from the past life, we took something from them, and from this life, they're coming to take it away, or we gave them something, and now they are coming to give it back to us. That's the relationship. That's the real relationship of family members and friends. Family members and friends that we cherish the most in this world are only our debitors and our creditors. And they have come to settle the account. They have come to settle the account. Sometimes they come in a form of a baby. And that baby might be a very, very sick baby a very, very sick baby, an abnormal baby. That baby comes into that family. The, when the baby was in the stomach of the mother, there were celebrations and celebrations and celebrations. When that baby came out in the form of a deformed baby, then there were cries. There were cries, there were suffering, accounts being paid, accounts being paid. That means that soul of the child, that soul of the child that came into that family, he was totally wronged by that family in the previous lives, wronged by that family. They did something to him. And now he's coming back for payment. He came in the form of a baby who is like abnormal. And then there is payment. There is payment. What is that payment? Suffering, suffering of the family. The family have to suffer. And according to the karma, it could last from one month 
to to one day to the whole lifetime to the whole lifetime of suffering this is how really the truth about the relationships of this world that the relationships of this world are really only a relationship of give and take only a relationship of creditors and debitors really that's what what it is and i'm sorry to say that but it's good to know the truth it's good to know the truth once we know the truth we we still have to go through our karma we cannot run away from our families we cannot run away from our families our friends if we have karma with them but to know the truth to know the truth is the most important thing to know the truth and then we perform our duty we perform our duty detached and unattached that means if we have children in this world we love them we do the best for them we try to put them on a spiritual path we try to nourish them spiritually as this is the best seva the best seva that god gave us these children for some reason and of course that reason is the debits and the credits but sometimes a spiritual sometimes a seeker comes in our family a seeker comes in a family of seekers that's the best thing when a seeker comes in a family of seekers then that he is not coming as somebody to cause pain and suffering a debitor or a creditor he's coming as a blessing he is coming or she is coming as a blessing to that family when a seeker a lover of god comes into a family oh my god that soul brings all ecstasy all peace and all blessing to all that family to all that family that is not connected to god if that family was i mean sorry to all that family that is and the seeker can come in a family that is not connected to god also that is not connected to god he could come in a family that is connected to god and then master has sent him there for a special reason for a spiritual development for a spiritual development that in the last life that soul did not have a good arrangement that soul did not have a good arrangement to be uh, and and could not meditate because he was in a, in the darkness in the dark family they could, did not allow him to meditate in his, his next life or her next life they were born to continue on they were put in a better atmosphere as master says life after life if it takes more than one life to to go back home let's say it takes four lives then every life will be better than the previous life that means it will be more conducive to meditation more conducive to meditation less attachments less desires and a better atmosphere a better atmosphere to meditate so yes a seeker can come in a family that is already seeking that's already initiated and and that's the big, a big blessing to that family that they got a godly soul that wants to develop spiritually and go more and more and more and sometimes sometimes god blesses a family that is not connected to god a family of mamluks a family that has no interest in their higher self and living just the life of a regular person who is totally entrapped by maya by the neg the negative power that means no no thinking of the higher self only running after what the mind wants totally controlled by the mind sometimes a soul is sent to that family to bless that family what kind of soul can be sent to a family like that a very very strong soul it has to be a soul that is strong otherwise that soul will not be able to be in that family to bless that family and change that family that soul comes from higher regions that soul has meditated in the past life and now is sent to that family now what happens when a soul like that is sent into that family and when the time comes when that soul gets awakened when that soul gets awakened then that soul has to fight a big war a big battle a big battle big 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 battle against the other forces that starts to work on him in the family where he's living because it's a family of darkness then the soul has to fight a big war has to fight a big war and if the soul is not strong enough as i said before it gets affected and then when it gets affected then mind takes control but as the soul grows as the seeking grows as the soul 
becomes less and less controlled by the mind and the soul controls the mind, then no matter what type of family we are in, whether it's a family of Mamluks or a family of lovers, of God lovers, then that soul is like a ship in an anchor. That soul is not disturbed by the winds of this world. That soul is a very strong soul in God. Nothing, nothing can move his concrete, his concrete, base is uh, what do they call it i forgot but the building when they make uh, when they start a building and they put the concrete and they say that's the i forgot the word but the, the base of the building the same way somebody who is strong in god who's strong in love who's lost in love who's always in love no matter what any where you put that person where you put that person you could put that person in in prison in the midst of darkness, you could put him anywhere, anywhere in this world. That person doesn't matter. That person from inside is connected to God. Nobody can, people can stop our outer actions, but nobody can stop our inner self, that they can even kill our outer body. And so many saints, so many saints, in the history of saints, Guru Arjan and Jesus and so many other saints were really put to the cross, were really killed, were really put on hot plates. But it didn't matter. It didn't stop their love. It didn't stop their devotion for a millisecond because they could stop you from the outside. Cal works in the realm of mind and space and can stop us from outside, but cannot stop our inner journey, cannot stop us from inside. And the soul that is strong in God, a soul that controls the mind, that soul, when you put that soul in any type of atmosphere, it changes the atmosphere. It changes the atmosphere and it cannot be controlled in, in that atmosphere. And then that soul is a really holy soul, very holy soul, because that soul becomes an instrument in the hands of light, an instrument in the hands of love. That soul becomes a holy soul, a holy instrument in the hands of holy God. That means wherever that soul goes, takes God, Master, and the kingdom of God in that soul. So all what I'm saying is that beneath, beneath everybody, there is something. There is a being hidden by a veil, hidden by a veil. Under that veil, could be a very, 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 very big devil or many devils in one body. As here, when we are, when we are not connected with God and we are addicted to, to things not from this God, not from, not, not from love, like movies, horror movies, or sexuality, or pornography, all these horrible things that are offered by the negative power, what happens? When people watch pornography, what happens? Then thousands of entities, thousands of entities take control of the soul and start to use that soul. Now, there are many entities. There are many entities in, in the physical realm, many entities. They call them disembodied souls. Those disembodied souls had a desire. They had the burning, 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 burning desire and they couldn't fulfill it and they died and they became a disembodied soul like a ghost and then they want they really 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 want to satisfy their desire because the, and then how could but they have no body they have no body so then somebody who likes what they like a person in the human body who likes what they like let's say watching pornography and they like something special in pornography, and that person that likes the same thing, then what happens? That entity possesses that person. It starts to live in that person. It starts to live in that person. It takes control of that person. It takes control of that person and starts to make the person dance on its own tune. That means the soul living in the body that is supposed to be in control of the body control of the mind starts to be ta taken over hostage, 
hostage by these devils, by these entities, by these devils and by these entities. So when, when we are, when all of a sudden we get a rush of anger, what is that? That's an entity that lives in us. That's an entity that lives in us that master has to clean it. When lust takes over us, and we start to do something without thinking, because you know how lust, when it takes over somebody, then that person loses its mind and just goes rushing towards that desire to fulfill that desire. We have seen it. We have seen it in this world, how when lust takes over you or me, but hopefully with master's grace, it will never, but... Yes, when like lust takes over a person, what happens to that person? That person loses its intellect and its sense of discrimination and sense of reasoning that really Kabir says that he doesn't want to live in this body anymore. This body is like tattered, that a roof with so many holes in it, a roof with so many holes in it. There are guards in this body, which are the reasoning, the reason the intellect and the reason. It's like a, some good qualities in the mind. The mind does, it's not always bad, but it does have something good in it, like reasoning, intellect, you know, intuition is from the soul. But yeah, reasoning and intellect. And they stand guard, they stand guard. But once, once the thieves come and the thieves come, then they, even with those guards, then the person is robbed, his wealth is robbed. The person's wealth is robbed. That means these guards of intellect, these guards of reasoning did not stop the thief from coming. That's what Saint Kabir in his poetry described. And the same way, when anger takes over us, when lust takes over us, we lose our wealth. We lose our wealth and we become enslaved. So yes, to put our attention on the world, we get possessed by all these things, all these things and they start to live in us, they start to control us and to enslave us. They start to control us and enslave us and steal our wealth, steal our wealth and steal our livelihood. Our livelihood in the form of life, they take the life out of us. They rob the life out of us. It's sucked out of us and then we start walking like zombies in this world, dead, dead, and not alive. This is what the negative power does. The negative power does, it possesses us, and then it steals. It steals our vital energy, vital fluids, and then we are always weak, dead, and zombies walking in this world, and anger takes over us, attachment takes over us, and wow, how horrible if we look in the mirror and look at our inner self, controlled by all these things, controlled by lust, controlled by many millions, millions of entities, millions of entities have taken control of us. We look at ourselves in the mirror and we say, oh my God, oh my God, because eyes are doorway to the soul. This is the job of the inner master. Imagine how much he has to clean, how much he has to clean, especially when we first come, if it's our first lifetime, our first lifetime coming to the master, then imagine, imagine what he has to go through, what he has to clean from inside. He has to clean millions and millions of entities, millions and millions of baggage and dirt and dirt and darkness has to be taken out of our soul. There is this story. There is this, it's a true story. It's a true story of my master, Santakar Singh. My master, Santakar Singh, uh, was sitting, sitting down and he had a cup of water that he drank from. And that cup of water was next to him. And then there was a, 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 there was a boy there. That boy was possessed by many, many entities. And, uh, and, uh, and he was in front of master. And then, after master took a sip of the water, he put the water next to him, but there was still water in the cup. And then that boy, that boy jumped to the cup and took a sip. After he took a sip, he started, he started just going on the ground and all these voices are coming out of him. 
you have poisoned me, you have poisoned me, you have poisoned me. In front of that, telling master, you have poisoned me, you have poisoned And master was saying, no, I gave you elixir. I gave elixir to your soul. No, you didn't give elixir to me. You gave elixir to the soul of the boy. I am being poisoned. I am being poisoned. And th th that, that, that's a true story. That's a true story. Now, I have seen my master, some talker saying, it was part of his mission to clean, to clean so many entities out of people. And I helped, I helped in that seva. I helped in that seva. There, there used to be tents. There used to be a big tent. And I used to give, um, my seva was to give sound help to people who could not hear the sound because of all these things that were taking over their bodies. And when master entered the room, you could see when, when a torch of light comes directly, directly what happens to the darkness, it just starts to, it starts to shiver. And, and the same way when master walked, walked, and those initiates, those initiates are the dearest to him, to him. Those initiates who were always, who had a possession of all these entities, they also had some also higher existence. They were in touch with the higher existence. That means the astral and the causal. Maybe they have done some voodoo, witchcraft, or some type of meditation without the help of a perfect master. And they, they attracted all these entities. And they were also, some of them were doing seva to the master. They were attracting all these entities, all these devils, and they were coming to those initiates and those initiates were coming. And when master was cleaning them, he wasn't just cleaning that initiate. He was cleaning the whole atmosphere, the whole three worlds out of these things, the whole three worlds. As we are connected, we are so connected with the physical. We are connected with the astral. We're connected with the causal. We are a whole being in ecstatic movement. I mean, that means us is the whole creation. Us is the whole creation. Whatever we see outside is coming from inside of us. That means we have an astral body. We have a causal body. And we have a soul. We have a, and we have a mind, universal mind. That means since, we, since everything came out of nothingness, out of shunni, and in the beginning shabd of Nizamuddin, I don't know if you missed it or not, but he said, kun fayakun. In Arabic, kun fayakun. He said, and it was done. God said, and it was there. And God is inside of us, said, and it was there, the whole creation. And the whole creation is inside of us and outside of us. The whole creation is inside of us and outside of us. So yes, when Master was cleaning these entities in those people, he was also cleaning the physical. There, He was cleaning them their temple and their temple is connected to the astral body is connected to the causal body so imagine imagine and those entities i used to hear them they were always speaking to master either cursing him or one of them was saying uh, and master was like who are you and he's like I i'm the peon i am the peon <laughs> there was like a group of thousands and thousands thousands of entities there in that person and that that uh, he said i am the peon <laughs> of that the big double that lives in that person. It was a whole process, a whole process where love moved, really cleanliness moves. This could, this is another, how could you could tell like also a perfect living master with that power of love, that power of love really cleanses and cleanses and cleanses everywhere it goes. It cleanses and cleanses. And that was what Wali Master Santakar Singh did, he cleansed from inside. I remember, I remember, I came also, like, I came and, you know, I, even though I, in the past lives, I was, med I, was I meditated and I was, uh, I was with Baba Sawan Singh and I was sent to this world for some seva, but in the beginning of my life, before initiation, then all, you know, God put me in a family that hunts and Oh, and all these things were like totally uh, possessing me, totally in me. So imagine how a horrible case I came to my master, Santakarsi. Big, big, big mess. Big, big, big mess. I can't tell you how big of a mess I was. So much, just like a worldly person who is not, um, who, who doesn't have the holy light and sound, it's automatically there. It's auto all of us, before coming to master, we were automatically engaged with the other power. 
engage with the power of darkness, whatever it offered for us. And we loved it. We were running after it. And it filled us. It possessed us. And it enslaved us. Now we, we were so lucky that we, see, we, we, had, we did the seeking. We did the seeking. And Master appeared in our life. And now the big job has started. I remember the first moment I stepped into the ashram of Santakar Singh. In Oregon, the cleaning has started. I was feeling, oh my God, what's happening to me? You know, uh, what's happening to me? Master was shaking the mud on the bottom of the ground. He was shaking the my mud. My mud was being when when it's shaken, then it goes all over. Then it's like, what happens? Because so many of us, we think we're so holy. We're so holy. Uh, yeah, we're so holy. Wait till the mud is shaken. Wait till the master shakes the mud and shows you what's really inside of you, what's really inside of you. And when I entered the ashram and ma the ma master started, boom, working on me and the inner mud was being shaken. And I was like, what's happening to me? Oh my God, I went and asked other disciples and they were like, oh, master is just cleaning you. You're going through cleaning. That is the fire of purification. We all have to go through the fires of purification. We all have to go through the rubbing of the ego, rubbing of the ego. And sometimes he rubs our ego really hard. And it could be with another lover of God, another Savidar that tells you something that's not the way you think. And your ego comes. Your ego comes or my ego comes. And then what happens? Master shows us that the ego is still there. Ego is burning, causing all suffering. There is a song that my master used to sing. Ego is burning, causing, causing all suffering. That the ego burns and causes suffering. Ego burns and causes suffering. Attachment burns and burns and burns. Have you ever been burned by the fires of attachment? Oh my God, oh my God. I have been burned by the fires of attachment. I remember how much painful it was when I was addicted. I was, I was like so attached, so attached to someone and that someone, that woman was taken away because her destiny was somewhere else. And I remember, I remember how much painful it was. It was like many daggers in my heart, many daggers in my heart. I have learned my lesson now. I have learned my lesson now. Only attach myself to God, only attach myself to my master. Only attach myself to my love. I have learned the lesson the hard way. I have learned the lesson the hard way. Sometimes master has to bring the hard way. Sometimes, sometimes master has to knock us really hard in order to shake the nonsense out of us. To shake the nonsense out of us, he knocks us really hard. It's a big, 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 deep blessing. Big, big blessing that that pain, that pain that we went through was the doorway for the light. That crack in our heart brought the light from God, brought the light from God and entered us. So pain is a big blessing. And if master brings pain, suffering, yesterday I read what, what, what was it? I read what the, 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 the state of mind of a perfect disciple. And that's from the Guru Nanak. And he says, if you, if, if you send, the Guru Nanak is saying, if you send me hunger, I shall be filled with thy name. If you send me miseries, I shall enjoy them as pleasures. If you send me happiness, I shall try, I, I will bow down to your feet. In sorrow, I shall praise thee. In sorrow, I shall praise thee. So anything that comes towards us after initiation, even before initiation, it's a blessing from God. It's to take us a step closer to our true self, a step closer to God, a step closer to the kingdom of God. And yes, pain, pain is a blessing. Even sickness is a blessing. A lot of people, they grumble and tumble when he sends them sicknesses. I also do. If he sends me a sickness, I will grumble. And... But deep inside, I know, it's a blessing. I know my master loves me. Kun fayakun, he said, and it was. That means he's the alpha, the omega, and in between. That means my master, my master is the commander in chief of this creation. His word is the ultimate word. 
if he sends me suffering, then it's a big, big blessing. He's releasing me, releasing me, and releasing me of big burdens. Now my soul is much lighter, and I can fly to God much happier. And he, so yes, if master sends pain towards you, if he sends, if he rubs your ego with other disciples, don't run away from your seva. Stand still and be a soldier, a strong soldier that fights. Be a warrior of God, a warrior, warrior and warrior of God. Never let the other power take over. Never let the other power take over. Always stay in the fort of master. Always stay in the fort of master. Always we should stay in the fort of master. From there, we can, from the fort, we can attack the other power. That means from inside here, from the third eye center, we can attack our lower self in the meaning, in the words of attack, I mean to purify, to purify our entities, our anger, our lust, our ego, our greed, and all these beings that live inside of us. Once we change ourselves with the help of the grace of master, we can change the world. A purified person, just like I said in the beginning, the sky by, bows down to the one who has cleaned his desires, who has no desires, no attachments to the fearless one. The sky bows down. In this way, in this way, really, really, it's a war of attrition. It's a war of attrition. Your ego will be rubbed. Your pain will come. The washerman will scrub you hard. Don't run away. Don't run away from the cleansing. Don't run away from the cleansing. Very few brave ones withstand the cleansing. We should be brave. We should be brave warriors of God, and not just warriors of God, the elite forces of God, the elite forces of God, the special forces of God. The special forces of God, they stand, they fight to the end. They fight to the end, and they never let go. That means if there is a scorpion in their house, they will not rest. They will not blink an eye, they will not go to sleep until that scorpion is removed. Until that scorpion is removed. That means if there's still any anger in us, if there's still any lust in us, if there's still any ego in us, if there's still any greed in us, we should not rest until it's gone. Why? Because if we rest, we give it power. When we rest, we take our attention away from master, then the other power starts to overwhelm us. It will kill us. It's waiting there. It's waiting to take full control of us. It, does, it wants to delay our journey into God and into the kingdom of God. If we do not stand guard in the fort of master, with the help of master, then that power will take over us and will destroy us. That means we have to be the elite forces of God, not to rest until our soul is fully purified, not to rest, do what it takes, do what it takes to be happy forever, to be happy forever. That means if there is still lust in us, if there's still anger in us, if there's still ego in us, that means we are a suffering soul, that means we are, not, we are still children in God's play. We should be called children, patients, animal ones, incompetent ones. <laughs> sorry, until, until, until we liberate ourselves completely, then we won't be called animal ones, horrible ones, crazy ones, crazy ones, <laughs> people who get angry are crazy, <laughs> crazy ones, lustful ones, then we will be called adorable ones, lovely ones, beautiful ones, divine ones, holy ones, godly ones, masterful ones, with master in control of our life. So yes, in this war of attrition, we should never, ever, ever let go, even for one moment, always stay in the fort of master and always keep connected at the doorway to the kingdom of God. And that way, when we are always connected to God, to the kingdom of God, then purity, purity and purity is added onto us, then, Happiness, ecstasy, blissfulness, drunkness in God. Drunk in God we walk, 
drunk in God we talk, drunk in God, drunk in God, and drunk in God. Why not be like that? Why not just always be happy, always be smiling, always be fearful, always be fearful? Why should we stay patient? Why should we stay ugly from inside? Imagine, imagine, as I said, that God gives us eyes to see and we could see beyond the veil. We could see beyond the veil. Imagine when you look into the mirror and you see your own self as a beautiful self, as a beautiful self dancing with Baba Salman Singh, dancing with Santakar Singh, dancing in God, dancing in the kingdom of God. Imagine when you look at yourself and you see your own light, you see your own image in the mirror of the soul, in that mirror of the soul. When we look and we see our own beautiful self, then that is what should be yearned for. That, what, that's our prayer. That's our only prayer that should be for Ishwarji, for Santakar, for Master. Please, please, please polish my soul, make me beautiful. I want to be beautiful because beauty is from the inside. Beauty is from the inside and it will come out as fragrance and as light, as fragrance of God and as the light of God. That means wherever we go, we spread the fragrance of the Lord. Wherever we go, we spread the light of the Lord. And our soul is beautiful bride now, married to God, married to God in the eternal wedding ring, the eternal wedding ring. The eternal wedding ring. Married to God forever. Did I ever show you my wedding ring? Did I show you my wedding ring? See Ishwarji, he's holding my wedding ring. That's my wedding ring with Ishwarji. Um, um, whoa. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, my wedding ring, that's um, I'm married to Ishwarji, married to God forever. That means he's my wife, he's my girlfriend, he's my mother, he's my father. And for eternity, I will just be with my father. I will be with my father. I will serve my father with my head under his foot, with my head under his foot forever. And uh, yes, I, I still have that ring. Um, and Master blessed it, and it's my wedding ring with God, my wedding ring with God. And uh, um, it's the gift from Master, the gift from Master, that wedding, a bride of God, to be a bride of God. And now my job, my job, my seva, is to really change myself totally, completely, completely. That means not to rest, not to rest until full purity, full whiteness, until all the enemies not are just removed to a big extent, but totally removed, totally removed. One time I asked Ishwarji, Master, is my last, because I was thinking, wow, I've been meditating for so many years now, and I still have lost. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe it's much, much more reduced, but I was thinking in my mind, like, is it ever going to go away totally? And I asked Ishwarji, I'm like, Master, is my last, ever going to go away and he, he looked at me and he said Michael not 99 percent it will go a hundred percent that means he knew what was in my head and he said that it will go hundred percent and that's my seva now to change it into the hundred to change it into the hundred that's all our seva our seva is to become the most beautiful brides of God the most beautiful brides of God to enjoy God to dance in God and to really do the seva, to sacrifice this life for what? For being drunk in God, being high in God all the time, all the time being high and drunk in God, all the time in the tavern of love, drinking and drinking and drinking. That means to serve master, to serve master and to serve master with nothing, with no expectation, just a selfless service with our head at his, under his feet, that will bring, that will bring the highest pleasure. That will bring the highest, it will bring God. It will bring the kingdom of God. And imagine, it will bring the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, as I said yesterday, there is not even one moment, one moment, as my master said, that is boring. That it's one enjoyment after the other enjoyment after the other enjoyment. That's why, what do we sacrifice? We sacrifice our ugly, our, 
ugly desires, our ugly thoughts, everything that is opposite of God inside of us, that's what we sacrifice. We sacrifice it and we serve master with love and devotion. And then we become spiritual kings, spiritual queens. And we keep growing and growing and growing and growing unlimited, unlimited and unlimited wealth. Billionaires in God, we shall walk. Billionaires and billionaires in God. We shall bring God to this world, then the kingdom of God to this world. This, this, we have to work hard for it. We have to put the effort. We have to look at our inner self, introspect ourselves, download, download St. Kirpal's diary. Start to fill it. Start to look inside yourself and cleaning, cleaning and cleaning. And in this way, in this way, at some point, we will be liberated. We will be liberated. The war will be won. The war will be won. The war will be won. The enemy will be conquered. And once the enemy is removed and conquered, then we can relax. Then we can relax that now we are in the kingdom of God, forever in the kingdom of God. We have reached the pinnacle of creation. We have reached the top and top and top of the mountain. Now we will never fall because that's it. We're on top. Once we reach the kingdom of God, our soul enters into the kingdom of God and becomes part of God. Then it can never go down. It can never fall. It can never fall again. And once we can never fall again, and we are living in God as God, that is the life. So I wish that on me, on all of us. And I put my head on my master's feet, and I say thank you for the seva, and thank you, and thank you. And oh, now we are playing, I, and there's exactly 11 minutes before we start to play master. So... Um, we have 11 minutes to enjoy our dear sister, Tina, and I can't wait to listen to her talk about Guru Nanak. Okay. Hi, my beautiful holy family. With the blessings of our beloved Ishwe Puri Ji Maharaj and Baba Saman Singh Ji Maharaj, I will begin the seva of Asa Ki Var. My sources of Asa Ki Var are Dr. T.S. Shingari, RSSB Asa Ki Var, uh, Sikhiwiki.org Free Encyclopedia, and Asa Ki Var Shri Penny Sahib. Before I start the pori, or the part, I will give a short background of Asaki War. Asaki War is a term recorded in the index to the Guru Granth Sahib, but this Gurbani is commonly called Asa Divar. It is found in the six scriptures from page 462, line 17 to page 475, line 10. It is a composition by Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhi, and is sung by Kirtaniyas, the religious musicians, at Sikh congregations or gatherings as part of the early morning service. It is said that if recited and sung with true belief, one's hopes, wishes are fulfilled. The term Asadivar comprises of three words. The word var means an ode or a lyrical verse. The word asa, which means hope in Punjabi, is also a rag or musical measure used in the Guru Granth Sahib. And the word ki or di means of. Thus, together the terms means a ballad of hope. Rag Asa is the rag of pre-dawn hours and the custom of reciting the hymns at morning time is traced to the days of Guru Nanak himself. It is said that by Lena Ji, later Guru Anga Dev Ji, was the first to sing it in the presence of Guru Nanak. The Var then comprises 24 Poris or stanzas by Guru Nanak and some shloks 
which were also of his composition as indicated in the title given by Guru Arjan Dev Ji when entering the composition in the holy book. The first Guru Nanak, in its present form, it carries 24 stanzas and total of 59 shlokas, 45 by Guru Nanak and 14 by Guru Angad Dev Ji. The message of Asa Ki Var does not tell a story. Its theme is how to become a spiritual person, a devta, a spiritual being. In it, Guru Nanak also warns us against the rituals and tricks of the priests and monks. The most important thing is how to build up one's character and how to remove the obstacles that lay in the path of a disciple the most important of which is the ego, selfishness, or conceit. Even holy person who are outwardly very good and kind often suffer from religious pride. Sometimes so-called religious people commit heinous crimes through self-righteousness and bigotry. It should be remembered that ego in its pure essence is self-awareness or identity which is regulated which when regulated is an essential for it is in the base uh, basis of one's character or moral nature when regulated by the right motivation and active service it is positive and beneficial but if uncontrolled through self pride of position or riches it becomes selfish and mean the effects of ego are particularly contemptible and disastrous when disguised by apparent holiness or traditions which exploits ordinary people's ignorance and credulity. The practice of humility and love are the most effective qualities for keeping people away from sin, far better than all recitations and rituals of religion. Initially, it is the fear of God's wrath or displeasure which inspires the seeker to offer worship and prayer. Over the years, this fear should become gradually replaced by love and self-surrenderance so that he loses his impatience with those who are imperfect. He is in sympathy with them for they are like the strayed sheep. Only by self-discipline and serving other people can one become worthy of divine grace. Associate with holy persons and learn from them the secrets of spiritual wisdom. Asadivar also deals with the concepts like guru, grace, egotism, pollution, and falsehood. The guru's personality and message transforms the life of the disciple. Guru Nanak says, by meeting the guru, the truth is realized. He banishes ego from the mind of man. He gives insight into the supreme reality. Only the Guru can grant the gift of the holy Nam. The Guru sets a course of life for his disciple, that of plain living and high thinking. Following this, the seeker's lifestyle begins to change. The good ones who are absorbed in the truth do service. They do no evil, they travel on the right path and do what is just. They break worldly bonds, they eat and drink little. There is also the concept of self. Our individual self is only a minuscule part of the universal reality. It is only by understanding our own self limits that we achieve the highest goals of our existence. Through ignorance, we engage ourselves in selfishness and enjoyment that will frustrate our hopes of a higher life. Man starts this life coupled to the background of his previous life. His past and present mold his future. We have self-will with which we can modify our own conduct. It is only when we attune our own will to the supreme will that we can become supermen. Asadivar in Serial Order, after explaining the role of spiritual teacher, Guru Nana goes to tell us that divine wisdom is acquired through the Guru 
intellect, the Guru offers us a vision of a God whose whole presence is made manifest in nature. The world is not a dream, but an impermanent reality. If people really observe God's creation, they will be filled with wonder. The entire cosmos follows divine ordinance or law, so should, so should we. The Lord is not pleased by the theatrics of so-called incarnates, but only by the act of love and devotion. The religious teacher instructs his disciples to distinguish good from bad, true from false. However, the assertion of individual ego is the great obstacle to the process of moral law, so that our self-assertiveness should be replaced by self-surrenderance, by submissiveness, submission to his divine will, and, may, and one may win the favor of the Lord. God, says Guru Nanak, is the creator of all that exists, and in his creation he manifested his name. He, the beneficent one, is a source of mercy and grace. They who attach themselves to his name are the winners in life, and the rest remain losers. One will find by his grace alone the true Guru, who puts him in the path of righteousness and helps him rid himself of his ego. The Guru will reveal to him the truth. Without the aid of the Guru, no one has comprehended the reality. The Guru helps one to overcome one's attachment to what is unreal and leads one to liberation everlasting. They who cherish the true Lord turn not their feet towards sin. Their path is paved with good deeds and they practice righteousness. They sing praises of the Supreme Being and rejoice in His grace. All the formal acts of piety and all the austerities performed at holy places will be of little wail. They alone will please the Lord who gave Him their loving devotion. God's own ministerial, Nanak, seeks the company of those who remain absorbed in him. Thank you, my dear Holy Family. I will continue the seva next week and we will start with the shloks and the paris. I may have made many mistakes. Please forgive your youngest sister for making those mistakes. And I will continue my seva next week. Thank you, dear sister Tina, and I'm looking forward for your coming up Seva. Wow. Thank you for starting the Seva again. We love your Seva. Thank you so much, dear sister Tina. And now I'll play our dear Holy Father. Welcome friends, I'm very happy to see all of you. Some of you are new friends and many of you are old friends. And even the new friends, sometimes I notice, are old friends. It's remarkable how when we meet people, we get a feeling that we have known them before. Not it's just not a feeling, we have known them before. Whether we like to believe it or not, the truth is that when we feel very close to a person that we meet for the first time, generally it is true that we have met that person before. There are people who have been initiated by masters. Perfect living masters have initiated them. They could not complete their course of meditation and could not follow all the instructions their masters gave them. And therefore they are back. 
when a person who is initiated into the spiritual path by a perfect living master cannot complete his course of duties as a spiritual disciple of the master, very often that person comes back again in another human form. But by that time, the master who was also in his human form has gone away because human body is very temporary, whether it is of a disciple or of a master. There are so many great, great spiritual entities, beings, personalities that came in the past. Nobody is alive forever. They all went away. The physical body is a very temporary garment we wear for a short time. Therefore, when a person is initiated by a perfect living master and cannot complete his course of the spiritual path and passes on, he generally comes back again in a human body. But because he has been initiated already by a perfect living master in the past, he is bound to meet another perfect living master alive at that time in the second incarnation. So far as I know, there is no exception to this rule. The commitment that a master makes to you at the time of initiation is such a perfect commitment, a permanent commitment. It is not a short-term vow at all. It's a very permanent commitment that you will be taken back home to your true home, Satchkhand, by a perfect living master. So if you have not been taken home by a perfect living master who initiated you and you are born again, you are bound to meet another perfect living master in a different human body. But because you have been through the course earlier, have been initiated earlier, you will get a jump start in the next life. And you will suddenly feel that the inclination towards the spiritual path will start very early in life. You will feel differently even as a child in the same family than others. You will feel that you are more inclined towards spiritual subjects, towards finding the truth, to discover the reality behind religions. There will be a certain tendency to go beyond other people in trying to find the truth. This is coming because you have been initiated in the past. And that is why all these feelings are coming right from childhood. As you grow, and at the right time, you find the other living master at that time, he will initiate you. For you, he is the living master. But in the course of meditation, he will show you who your previous master was in a past life. So the link will be complete. This will happen at the right time. Now, when I mention right time, people ask me, what is the right time? The right time is not based upon what work you did on the spiritual path. Right time is based on a total combination of different karmas, different destinies that have been put together to create the present life. These destinies that make our present life have many ups and downs. And those ups and downs have been picked up from past lives and put together to create a destiny of the present life. Nobody has a life which has all ups, nor anybody has a life which is all down. There's a mixture of good and bad, mixture of high and low. There are many planets and many levels of existence where people are living who have all bad deeds. We call those places hell. And there are many people who have had great good deeds and they are living in places we call heavens. There are heavens and hells which are also inhabited by a lot of souls and a lot of beings are there. But if you have to be born as a human being 
on this planet Earth or a similar planet elsewhere in the universe, you have to have a combination of high and low. And that is why we all have combination of high times and low times in our lives. When we say this is the right time for something to happen, it depends on those circumstances which have created the high and the low. Very often, the highs can come in the beginning and the lows can come later so that you have a great experience and then it is shut off for a while. Or it may be the other way around. You spend a life of many misfortunes and then suddenly you find that you have paid off all the karma and at that time is the right time when you start making great progress and the spiritual progress is so fast you suddenly link up with what you had done in the past life. Therefore, it is not important to say just because a person was initiated in a past life, in this life he must be enlightened right from the beginning. Sometimes the time is much later in life, depending upon the karmic pattern that is chosen. The masters themselves are human beings like us. There is no difference between any one of us and a master so far as the human life is concerned. They are born with the same karma. They are created in the same way as all human beings. They live the same kind of life. They eat, drink and grow up and they do everything else which all human beings do. They are no different as human beings. The only difference between a perfect living master and ourselves is in the level of consciousness, level of awareness of that person. It does not mean he has a different destiny altogether. They all have the same destiny. They fall sick. Perfect living masters have all fallen sick. They have had accidents. They have had highs. They have won lotteries sometimes. Some have won in the casinos. <laughs> they have had a life which resembles our life. Indeed, when a perfect living master comes in a particular territory upon this planet and comes in response to certain marked souls which have to be picked up by that master, very often the life of that master will be very akin to the life of the disciples where he is coming. If they are in a high status, he will come in a high status. If they are in a poor status, he will come in a poor status. If a master has a combination of disciples, in high status and poor status, he will undergo through both of these states himself so that he can be with the people in the same state. The reason why a perfect living master comes exactly like us is that it is essential for two human beings to experience love to be alike. If somebody is very high up, can fly in the sky and is not like us, he can be a master, he can be a magician, he can demonstrate his special skills, but he cannot be a friend. Masters are friends first and masters next. It is through friendship that we realize the value of a master. The reason for this is that the mind of a human being confines us to the three worlds of the physical life that we're leading here, the astral life of the sensory systems that we have, and the mental life of thinking, reasoning, logic, and so on. These three worlds do not contain love and friendship. They do not contain the highest virtues like intuition, happiness, joy, bliss. Those virtues come from the soul which is beyond the mind. Therefore, these perfect living masters who come here, they employ their physical presence, they employ their sensory systems like any one of us, they employ their mental reasoning, they talk to us with their minds, they answer our questions which are mental, only for the sake of satisfying our minds and our bodies. And ultimately, their method is to take us beyond all these three worlds, through love, devotion, beauty, joy and bliss and intuition. Those things belong to our real soul, do not belong to our mind. That is why, although we come across these perfect living masters, 
and have an experience of physical friendship, of mental equivalence, of having nice discussions with them, hearing their good discourses which appeal to our mind and to our logic. But that is not their real purpose. These are all to satisfy our mind, to get the mind out of the way, as it were, so that our spirit can then get in touch and have true communion with those masters through the power of love and devotion. The real path, the spiritual path, is love and devotion. The rest is all made up for the mind. The rest is all made up to satisfy us so that we can move ahead to the true path of spirituality. I have come here to meet all of you, to share with you my experiences with a great master. He was called the great master. He was great. I would call him the greatest. When you have an experience with a master who demonstrates that all the truths you have ever read about, all the truths that you have heard about, are being symbolized in that one man, and he is able to prove to you, to the hilt, intellectually and spiritually, that all these truths can be verified in your own lifetime by yourself. You have no words left to describe such a person. And yet on the outside, that person looks like anybody else. But inside, it's the awareness of the person. As you get to know a perfect living master more and more, you find he knows you better than you know yourself. That he understands you not only outside as a friend, not from the description you have given him, but he knows exactly your entire background of destinies. When he looks at you, he can see your soul. He does not care too much for the outward appearance of a person. He wants to see how the soul has been tormented by the mind, how the soul has been tormented by the mind creating a cycle of karma, cycle of action and reaction that has bound him down to this prison house. He looks at that. He has great love and compassion for the soul of a person. And it's for the soul that he has come around. He is returning a call from the soul of a person. And all our souls make a call when we are fed up with this world. All our souls call up when we find that this is not what we are looking for. There is something more to be looked for. When we are really looking for something beyond the physical, the ephemeral, the phenomenal, when we are looking for the reality, that's the call of the soul comes to, in response to that. But while the soul is calling for help from the ultimate awareness, ultimate consciousness, the mind is coming in the way. Therefore, the mind has to be taken care of. That is why these masters come and they deal with us at every level. And we find that they are able to solve the problems that are coming in the way of our spiritual development. Very often we do not know what those problems are. Sometimes we think a master is here to give us some good blessings for worldly things. And we put up a list of our worldly requirements. The masters look at them and they say, well, that's good. We'll try and help you with them. It will satisfy our mind. And to avoid a total diversion of our attention, there is a little story about a gardener and told in India very often this story that there was a gardener who was planting a little seedling, a little small plant in the soil. And a young man passing by saw that the gardener was putting that little plant in the midst of all the weeds. And he called out to the man, he said, old man, don't you realize you are putting this little plant in the midst of these weeds and the weeds will eat it up. And the gardener looks up at him and he says, have you planted this plant before? He says, no, I haven't, but I can see the weeds around this plant. He says, this is different. This plant outgrows the weeds. When I plant it in the soil and I give it food, of course the weeds will eat up the food too. I give it water, 
the weeds are being fed on the water too but gradually the plant grows taller than the weeds and eventually becomes like a big bush and under the shade of that big bush the weeds wither away and die this is the story of our state we are looking for worldly desires which are like weeds and the master comes and plants a little seedling of love in our heart and while the seed of love is growing in our heart we are still looking at the worldly things how we can get those things how we can get help in those worldly things and therefore the master says yes he feeds the worldly things also he helps you in so many little things and we said master real he has been able to give me a get me a promotion i was able to get some money from there i was able to buy a new house i was able to buy a car i was able to buy these various things here and we think the master is helping in all this he is helping in all these things so that the love in us keeps on growing ultimately the love grows to a point when none of these things matter and we said master we don't mind if you take all these things but let the love remain here so it's the same example that the masters play a very artful game with us that they no real they realize our traps we have so many traps built around us of which we are unaware the biggest trap is that we think that this body is ourself that's the biggest trap because then we try to take care of the body we buy all kinds of lotions and potions and go to different kind of treatments to keep the body in great good shape and we think this is taking good care of ourselves what is happening inside we don't care what we put inside the body we don't care we eat junk food we put all kinds of bad thoughts in the head and we think we are doing a great job by just like taking care of the outside appearance of the body that's a big trap because we fail to realize that the body is a very temporary thing and we are not temporary that when the body before the body came we were there and after the body goes away we'll still be there and this is not known to us having forgotten that we are misled and trapped by the body the second trap is of desires and attachments that we like to have things we enjoy things we love things love is a natural part of our soul therefore we love things that we can see and experience we have shut ourselves on the inside we do not know that the consciousness has different doors open nine doors on this body open outward the two eyes the two ears the two nostrils the mouth and two lower apertures these nine <coughs> doors open outside and draw our attention outside into the world and we think that is the reality so once we do that we do not know there is any other door which can see perceive any other world whereas just right behind these eyes lies a tenth door that opens inwards opens up a new world altogether we are unaware of it therefore all our love and attachments goes to outside things through these nine doors and therefore we think this is the only desirable thing is what is outside in this physical world we do not even know how the physical experiences are being created we think that the physical experiences are being created in a world that has always existed for millions of years and we have come only temporarily into it if the reality were to be found out that we create our world from inside that the real manuscript from which the show is being drafted and projected out is inside that the projector itself into which the film has been loaded is inside we are looking at a 3 4 5 dimensional screen outside and therefore we are thinking that what is happening outside on this multi dimensional screen is the only reality and we forget that the projector is playing right inside creating this it doesn't happen to us only in life we go to see a movie and the movie we are watching the screen there is nothing in the screen the projector is behind us the light behind the projector which throws the picture on the screen is behind us the light going through the film 
throws a picture on the screen and we are watching the screen and saying what's going to happen now and we are constantly looking at the screen as if that's the real show going on and we think something is going to happen now it's a tragic moment we cry we laugh in the movie we take it for real if we we forget totally that there is a projector behind us it's just a film later and the film has been prepared much in advance we forget that too we think that this is all happening now there was a uneducated indian boy who had not used to these movies in india and he went to see a movie in that movie there is a girl who is going to strip herself to jump into a pool and when she is taking her clothes off unfortunately a train comes in front <laughs> and by the time the train goes she is in the pool <laughs> he went to the movie 20 times <laughs> he was waiting one day the train will be late <laughs> we are in the same state we do not realize the movie is going to run the way it's been programmed we do not realize we think we are going to change this something else is going to change we can interfere with it we have free will to do it all these are very big traps for us these traps keep us completely diverted from our own self not only do we don't know where the 10th door is which can open into other universes and experiences we think that what is happening outside is unpredictable we have a hand in the predictability or unpredictability of what is happening and therefore we can alter what's going on it's amazing that we can do nothing we think we can but the thoughts that we generate to to use our free will to evaluate what choices to make we do not realize have been pre-recorded therefore the trap is very well laid so that we feel an actual experience of free will the only reason we we feel we are free will is we are ignorant of the future supposing you got knowledge of 5 minutes of the future your free will will disappear because you will notice that what you are thinking about making a choice has already been made this happened to me in india i had gone to a navy interview to join the navy when i came out i met a man with a turban and he said do you have a piece of paper and i said yes i had some paper with me i gave him paper he said a pencil i gave him my pen and he scribbled something on that little piece of paper looking at my eyes and he went on scribbling something that he folded the paper several times over made a little piece and said hold it in your palm so i held it in my palm and he said do you have some more paper i said sure so i gave him some more paper and he said write on this paper any number between 1 and 10 and i thought to myself this is a common childish trick we used to do when we were children I said think of a number between 1 and 10 and we'll make a guess and we guessed five most of the time we were right because when you give this quick question to somebody think of a number between 1 and 10 the first thought is the middle which is five i said this guy is expecting me to write five <coughs> i am going to call his bluff and i'll write three so i wrote three he then said write the name of a flower so i knew the most common and popular flower is rose and i knew that he is expecting me to write rose i'll think of a flower that he has never heard of this interview was taking place in a state uttar pradesh in the center of in, in the country where a certain flower is not even known i said i'll think of a flower from my state of punjab which he has never heard of and put that down so i wrote the name of a flower unknown to most people in that area called chameli c h a m e l i i wrote that he said write your date of birth so i wrote 1926 he said you have written your year of birth write your date 
Normally, date is written before the year, but I added the date, 26th November, after the year. He said, now open the little paper I gave you in advance. I opened the paper, and it said, three, Chabeli, and the correct date, like I had written, exactly like I, I wrote, it's almost a copy of that. I was completely taken over by this strange experience. How could the man know something that I haven't even decided about? How could the man write in advance something that I still have to choose with a free will, which I employed? While I was still thinking, how could he do it? He said, shall I tell you something more? I said, go ahead. He said, when you wrote three, you said, I am going to call the bluff of this guy, and therefore I won't write five. And when you wrote the word Chameli, you said, he thinks I'll write rose, and I'll write the name of a flower he has never heard of. He repeated my entire thought process in which I was making the choice. It occurred to me at that time, it's worth study that when we say that we are making a free choice with free will, is it really free? Or are we being governed by some script that has been written earlier, which includes the process of choice making, which includes all the arguments we are using in our head? If the script is good, and it's a good trap for us, it has to be inclusive of all the consideration we give when we make a choice. And if that is written up, we'll never know. If we cannot know the future, then the free will must be real. So then I realized for the first time, our free will is entirely dependent upon ignorance. That if we acknowledge, there'd be no free will. But yet, it's a good experience of free will. It's an actual experience of free will. So there must be some purpose. Why is it that we have been hidden from the real knowledge just to have an experience that we are deciding things. If with knowledge we can find out that we are not the real person who are deciding things, they have been written out in a script, then what will happen to us? If we knew, if all human beings knew that we know our future, we know exactly how we'll decide things, how it will happen, and therefore free will is lost as we know it. What will be the kind of life we'll have? So I discovered there is a certain island in the astral plane, in a higher level of consciousness, where people know the future. They live like zombies. They live like robots. They just go along the script. They're actors. They can't depart from the script. Then I realized we are actors too. We are following the script too. But we have been denied the knowledge of the script except that we have to follow it anyway. And therefore it's the greatest show on earth. <laughs> this is the best show that you could set up where you have to follow the script. You cannot go out of it and yet you don't know that it's in the script and you think you are deciding as you go along. What is the big advantage of this setup? Why did the creator think of such a thing in human life? Incidentally, this only happens in human life. A tree has no choice, never decides anything. Insects don't decide, birds don't decide. They go by instinct, automatic reactions to everything. Dogs, mammals, angels don't decide because they know it in advance, they go by the script. No other form of life decides anything. No other form of life has the experience of free will except human beings. try today meditation behind the eyes with love and devotion. Where you visualize your beloved 